Remy, if you can give me screen share, please. Yes, of course, I can do that. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Oh, isn't it wonderful just to be able to worship together with believers? I think that's the most beautiful thing on planet Earth is just being with people like you guys just worshiping together. Just absolutely awesome. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and thank you again. Right, I'm going to share something here. Here we go. Uh, share and I am going to go slideshow from the beginning. Right. Now, um, I'm going to share on this topic because there seems to be quite a lot of confusion with a lot of people at various times. In this group, this topic has come up a couple of times before, and scripture is very, very clear, and we shouldn't be confused in any way. So I'm hoping by the end of this little talk that I'm going to be giving, that you will have clarity and an assuredness within you. And I'm expecting lots of lots and lots of questions. Any question that you've got around this topic of salvation, please start writing them down and we'll do our best to answer them with everybody here. So let's go and enjoy this. Come Holy Spirit, open our hearts, open our minds to hear your word. Um, you know, often when we open the word, um, we're not looking at the word in a wide lens. There's a certain way when we look at the, the, the scriptures that need to be unpacked. And I was walking, doing a walk this morning with the dog and this little story came back, came to me. And I just want to share it as we start. And this guy was trying to find God's will and he decided, okay, he's going to open his Bible at random. And his eyes fell on and Judas hung himself. Whoa. Closed his Bible and said, okay, let's go random and open it again and looked again. And then he read, go and do likewise. <laughs> Not a good way to do life. <laughs> so let's have a, f a, a, a little bit of a look here. Oops, see if I can just move that out of the way. Um, to look to answer such doctrinal questions, we need to look at the scriptures and make scriptures are clear. In searching the scriptures, we always need to consider the following. And these might be some new ideas and new thoughts. There's quite a few things we've got to take into account when we look at the scriptures. Number one, we never form a doctrinal opinion on one scripture alone. So in the uh, Bible, you will find about women not talking in church or women wearing hats or not wearing hats. And some people make a whole theology around that. But what you will find is scripture confirms itself. So we never form a doctrinal opinion on one scripture around. That's the first point. Another aspect when we're looking at scripture, we must look at which people group is being addressed. Because there are three people groups addressed in the Bible. They're the Jews, who are obviously uh, following Judaism. They're believers, and they're non-believers. And scriptures that are written to a non-believer we can't take upon ourselves. And that which is written to Jews, we can't take about upon ourselves and vice versa. So when we're looking at a piece of scripture, we need to say, who is being addressed in this piece of scripture? It is 
always important to examine the original Greek and Hebrew words, their idiom, nuances, and euphemism. And I always love the way that Stella, because of her Greek background, can open the scriptures and see a whole different nuance because our words are so limited in the English. Um, we were uh, installing a Bible program on Margie's computer, and we discovered there are, uh, was it 14 different words for the word love? We say love. I love my dog, I love ice cream, and I love the Lord. They're all different, and I love my wife. That's also different. And when we start looking at scripture, you know, and I'm just going to use an example here. Remember when uh, the disciples had gone fishing, Jesus had been resurrected, and the guys had been fishing, they'd gone back to their boats, and they were casting their nets, and they'd been fishing all night. And then Jesus is on the on the shore, and he says, cast your net on the other side, and they come in with this miraculous catch. And Peter gets very excited and afterwards in that story Peter and Jesus are going for a walk and uh, Jesus says to Peter Peter do you love me and this is the English translation and Peter answers yes Lord you know I love you he says feed my sheep then he asks G uh, Peter a second time Peter do you love me Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. And the third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And at this time, you can see there's a re reaction in Peter. And if we look at that Greek word, then we start seeing what a, the innuendo was. And this is how it should be read in the uh, translations. Peter, do you agape me? That means lay down your life, die for me. Not considering yourself in any way. And that's what uh, Peter had done. He had denied the Christ. Peter's answer is, Lord, I phileo you. And it's a love affection. The second time, it's exactly the same. Peter, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo. The third time, though, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. And that's why we always need to look at these words, the Greek and the Hebrew words. And this is quite easy if you get a concordance with the, or a Bible app with a concordance in the Strong's word. And you can just look at these words. And there's so much more when we expound on the original meaning. And our English translations is very, very, very limited. So I want you just to look at your hand. Because there's something about when we look at the Bible, um, if you look at this and you think this is Genesis all the way through to Revelations, there are five events that change our relationship or man's relationship with God. And let's just go through them. So the first event. Number one. So there we are. That begins with the fall of Adam and Eve. And they are out of the kingdom, out of the Garden of Eden, and they live in, in a period of time over here. And as time goes on, another event happens. And it's the Abrahamic covenant of uh, that is established. God established the Abra Abrahamic covenant. Uh, and this was the first time, well, it's not the first time. It is a covenant in which it's a belief co covenant where you had to just believe. You didn't have to do works. And we know this because in Hebrews it talks about it was accredited to Abraham because he believed. And yeah, the Jews are living in another period of time. 
to the next event. So in this period of time, this is where the Jewish nation lands up in Egypt. And in Egypt, they start prospering. The Egyptians don't like this. They start persecuting him, persecuting them. They have the Abrahamic covenant. They call out to the Lord and the Lord raises up Moses to take them out. But as they come out over the Red Sea, because they had been polluted by the way the Egyptians had done life, they said, we don't want to have a relationship. We'll have you, Moses. You speak to our God. We not, don't want to have that relationship. And so God gave them the law. And this is all about works. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do that. And he made it impossible for them to fulfill the law. Because one of the laws is you need to circumcise, circumcise a male infant on the eighth day. But you must rest on the seventh. What happens when the eighth day is the Sabbath? The priest is now doing a work. And, there's, and they've gone into great detail how to understand this. And I've heard some very, very strange things from very orthodox Jews of what they do. So currently, if you open your fridge, in a Jew's mind, in some Jews, not all Jews, the light comes on, you're doing a work. Well, you mustn't work on the Sabbath. So what they do the day before they come to the Sabbath, they unscrew the light globe. Seriously. So they can open the, bar, the, the fridge on a Sabbath and not do a work. The other one, if you were in a lift, you mustn't press the button because that's a work. See how ridiculous it becomes. But if somebody else presses the button, it's okay. And that's how it became so ridiculous. When we start trying to fulfill the law, we cannot. And so, oops, there's a period of time that we live in from the law to the next major event which is the new covenant established at the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus was born under the law to do away with the law. And on his resurrection, he established the new covenant. And the next event in the Bible is the return of Jesus, which is as far as we all are soon. He is coming back. He's coming back for the bride. And this is what this group has been talking about time and time again. So where are we living? Well, we live here under the grace covenant. And we've got to be very careful when we take scripture, say from there or from there and from there, to see how it fits under the grace covenant. And this is a covenant of not doing works. It's a covenant of grace. So when we look at scripture, we need to look at where these scriptures are in the Bible. And we have a lot of things that Jesus said over there. But the only time Jesus really got into this new grace covenant that he was going to establish was in the Gospel of John 14, 15, 16. Those, he really gets excited just before his arrest and the crucifixion. And when Jesus spoke, he, sell, well, he, he hinted at the new covenant. There's a new covenant. There's a new covenant. But mainly he spoke about the kingdom. The kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. So he was mainly speaking to Jewish believers as well because he was a Jew. So when we look at his things that we say, we've got to be careful because there is a new covenant over here and God raised a Paul to give us an understanding and others how we live under the new covenant. So what else do we need to look at? We always need to look at the historical context when the passage was written and what problem was being addressed. And the next thing we have to do is how do we apply this 
for us today, bearing in mind all those things. So, um, on Saturday, unfortunately, I wasn't there, but I have listened to all that uh, Michael and Stella said and was um, very, very good. And I'm just, it's just a expanding of what they say. And it's not saying what they've said is anything different. No, it's all good, holy teaching there, but it's just a further expansion of what they've said so that we can really sort this issue can I lose my salvation out once for all? And I've highlighted Hebrews verse six, verses four to six. It is impossible for those who have shared in the gospel. All right, let me read the whole thing. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again, subjecting him to a public disgrace. Now, you will not understand this whole big last bit. Uh, who have fallen away because they've crucified the Son of God and subjected him to pu uh, public disgrace. Unless you understand why the book of Hebrews was written, who's addressed, what issue was being addressed. And I'll just expand a little bit on that. Then there's this other scripture which uh, uh, Michael and Stella shared. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished? who has trampled, notice that word, a very strong word, trampled the Son of God underfoot and treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. Very, very powerful scriptures. Let us go and have a look about the book of Hebrews and then we'll be starting to understand what is going on and then you'll be able to formulate an idea of whether you can lose your salvation or not. It is written in the Greek to the Jews who accepted Jesus as their Messiah. It's not written to the Gentiles. That's why it's called the book of, that's why it's called Hebrews. It's called the Messiah, uh, Messianic believers. Secondly, it is written in a very polished Greek grammar using a, ret a rhetorical argument. In other words, you can't argue with it. So the writer of the book of Hebrews, um, from the language he used, uh, the conclusion by the people that know Greek and gone into that, it is, is somebody who was very learned in the way of Greek thinking and Greek argument. And he is presenting a whole argument uh, in a very clear, this, therefore that, this, therefore that, this, therefore that. And I'll go into that a little bit more. It is an exhortation. It's not a letter. So Paul often wrote the letter to the Corinthians, the letter to Philippians, the letter to Thessalonians. But this is like a uh, document that somebody sat down and he wrote out for a clear exhortation to the Jewish believers who were caught in a very difficult situation. And this whole book should be read as a whole. You cannot take pieces out and then get a complete meaning of it because it is written as a whole expose on a certain aspect which covers various aspects um, of, of doctrine. What it is doing, it is setting forth an argument that the new covenant 
is better than the Mosaic law covenant. And it highlights the consequences of going back to the old. And it's actually divided into three parts. I'm not going to go into that because it can be quite a long talk on that. But there's an argument, old covenant, new covenant, and the consequences if you go there. Then another argument, new covenant, and the consequences if you go back there or don't follow. And then the third part, again. So it's this argument of there is nothing left in the old covenant that you can go back to. So when you see that, I uh, hopefully your minds are beginning to, okay, what was really happening here? And when you start understanding the historical context, it starts making sense what this book is about. So historically, what was happening at the time? So Caesar and the Roman Empire, Caesar was considered to be Lord. And every subjugated nation had to bow down and say, Caesar is Lord. But as Jesus comes, Jesus is Lord. So now we've got a tension here. The problem was that this Christian movement after the resurrection and ascension started becoming bigger and bigger and people were accepting and a movement was growing, 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 growing. And Rome was concerned that it would overwhelm because of this one thing and many other things, uh, they say, Jesus is Lord. So what they would do, they'd go into a village. They'd get everybody in the village, and there's this whole, uh, all these Roman soldiers around them. And they'd say to them, you've got to say Caesar is Lord. And if you didn't, you and your family were executed there on the spot. So you can just imagine your life is at stake here. And if you said Jesus is Lord, that was the end of you. And, and it's very interesting if you go to the book of Corinthians, the the uh, to talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I think it's 1 Corinthians 12, it says we they could only say Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. So when you are in this life and death situation and the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you are able to stand up against the most atrocious adversity. Stephen is another example. They stoned him, but he looked up and he saw heaven. So in these extreme moments of persecution, the Holy Spirit can come upon you and you love not your life even unto death. And it's only by the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this by your own power. And that's why the Holy Spirit has been sent to help us. So I was talked about being Caesar is Lord. Now, interesting. Of all the nations that Rome conquered, they never were able to conquer the Jews. And we don't have the book of the Maccabees and the history of the Maccabees, but we sometimes, well, we might know the story of Masada. The Jews would not bow down to Rome. But they were very good negotiators. And what they eventually did, they negotiated with Rome the following. They were allowed to follow Judaism. They were exempt from saying G uh, Caesar is Lord. They had their own laws and their own police. And therefore they had their inner courtyard, the outer courtyard, and the Holy of Holies. And they had this autonomy, a state within a state. They even had their own money. So the Jews got away with it. So if you were a Jew, a practicing Jew in Judaism, a member of the synagogue, not following Jesus, and the Roman soldiers came in, 
you were allowed to walk away. So now you can imagine So the Messianic Jew returning, okay, I'll just go a little bit, what happened there, uh, just before this. So these Jews that had accepted Jesus, um, they were now caught in a difficult position. They could either die if they... Uh, didn't say Caesar was Lord, or they could go back to Judaism because they were that's where they were exempt. And this is what was happening. These Messianic Jews who had tasted the goodness of the, law, of, of the new covenant, the Holy Spirit, because they were fearing, started going back to Judaism. But when they went back to Judaism, they had to publicly, in the public place with the synagogue there, renounce Jesus, the blood and the cross. Basically, they had to spit on it. They used to say, this is false, this is an error, and now you can see it was a public choice renouncing Jesus, the cross and the blood. So let us read these verses again and look at them. Because they are renouncing, I'm writing here in the red, I'm here in the red, but because they were renouncing publicly that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, had come to earth, established the new covenant, and we had the Holy Spirit, they were crucifying the Son of God all over subjecting to public disgrace. It's not something they were doing quietly. This was publicly. It had to be done publicly. Look at verse chapter 10. Who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that had sanctified them? Who was, who has insulted the spirit of grace? Can you see it was a real renouncing of a faith going back to an old. And the whole book of Hebrews is exhorting these people and saying, guys, there's nothing left there to go back to. You cannot go back to that. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is really about. So how can we lose our salvation, if that were ever possible for any of us here? Well, number one, you need to go back to Judaism, renounce Jesus, the cross and the blood. And I don't think any of us are actually from Jewish descent. And I don't think any of us would really do that. And I just was thinking what the possible questions. So. Is there a possibility that we could go to other, some form of other religion or even Satanism? I say anybody that has been set free from a bondage, and I speak from my own life, I came out of an Eastern philosophy, I had to be set free, I know what it's like to be demonically oppressed, I know what it's like to be set free from that. I could never go back to that. There's no ways I could go back to that. Having tasted how good the Lord is. And then you have to publicly declare, after you've experienced the Holy Spirit, his gift, miracle signs and wonders, saying, oh no, 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 and this was Satan. That's basically what you're trying to do. And I don't think any of you could ever do that. There is scriptures to confirm this. And this is called blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's not quenching 
or grieving the Holy Spirit. That's completely different. And one day I'll do a talk about quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. This is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Just like I've said. So if we look at Matthew verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, what did they say? It is only Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. They were saying what Jesus was doing was done by Satan. That's all. And he has Jesus' words, and it's confirmed in a number of cases. So I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But when you attribute something of God that is from the Holy Spirit to something else, that's blasphemy. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And yet, yeah, this, this is quite amazing. Jesus says, and anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Well, in the context, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. And what they did to him, the crucifixion, the beating, the spittings and all that, that was sin. And he said, it's okay, guys. I'm doing this because I love you. But Jesus goes on, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And it has to be in the context where you experience the miracle in life. You've been healed from cancer. Uh, God has provided you, set you free from demonic oppression. And then you go back and you say, oh, it was the devil that did this. Either in this age and in the age to come. So when we go through our hand, we can see he's referring to where we are now. This is confirmed in Mark 3 and in Luke 12. So the question here is, can you lose your salvation? I think we'd have to be, I don't know, <laughs> extremely dumb <laughs> or something must go totally wrong inside our heads to be able to lose our, our salvation. And I know Margie and myself, we've been challenged whether we could ever go away from Christianity. And, you know, when we were challenged, and Margie did share a little bit about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. She did a personal disclosure. We thought about it. I'll just give you the context. Our daughter who had been drawn away, came to us and said, you either have a relationship with me or you have a relationship with Jesus. If you have a relationship with me, I'm cutting off relationship with you. And this, as parents, is one of the most hardest things you could ever do, be challenged with. And we sat, and you know, there was no ways we could move, to walk away from Jesus. No ways. And I know that every one of you here, you can't do this. And I'm going to categorically say, you guys, you cannot lose your salvation. And as Michael and Stella expounded, it's not about sin. This is by making a conscious, open, public choice, denouncing Jesus, the cross, the blood, the Holy Spirit. I hope this has helped you in this, this thing that's causing us a little bit of confusion. That your salvation is secured irrespective of what you did, have done, could do. When I spoke on Thursday, I opened with the principle and said was this. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your sins past, present and future are already forgiven. And I can expand further why we sometimes trip up, get
get caught up in this, get caught up in that. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not anywhere to do with your salvation. That's growth and maturity. And it's just a thing that we've got to go through. I'm open for any questions. Rami, can you come in now? I'm going to leave my mic on so I can speak.